Why don't you go to the book of Daniel? Eventually, I'm going to get around. My series is called Daniel 70 Weeks, and eventually going to get to them, I promise you. Um, but uh, we're in the ninth chapter of Daniel. Chapter 9 is divided in two sections, and if you have a study Bible, they'll probably divide it for you. <clears throat> Verses uh, uh, 1 through 19, that's the prayer, Daniel's prayer for um, the people, <clears throat> and... Um, it's kind of interesting um, where Daniel is. And then verses 20 through 27, <clears throat> uh, he, this is uh, the prophecy of the 70 weeks is where that's found. The first 19 verses deals with the prayer. <clears throat> now, this prayer of Daniel's is really important. The, this prayer is very important to his prophecy. Not only that, but whenever God records a prayer in the Bible in its contents, you ought, to, you ought to really pay close attention to it. And he does this every once in a while with prayers. He'll record the whole prayer. Um, so for me, I, I'm thinking he must be impressed with it. Uh, in the sense that it was done right. The way it was, the protocol to that prayer, the way it was handled and done. And so when I find them, I think, whoa, we should really. And so the contents of his entire prayer is recorded in, 19, in the ninth chapter. <clears throat> and it is very important to the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And um, it, it's a, and tomorrow night I'm going to look at the context the contents of his prayer. We're going to go over the absolute prayer, but tonight I'm going to look at the first three verses because <clears throat> circumstances in our life is what brings about the type of prayer we pray. And Nothing could be more obvious to my Tuesday night Bible study because after we do our Bible study, we do have prayer. And you can see how the circumstances of a person's life directs the, his need for prayer and how we orient our prayer to it. And so uh, as I got into this prayer of Daniel, and then I saw, when I began to read it, I saw that the Lord... Um, put the whole thing down in paper. I mean, he took up space in the Bible. I mean, we don't have a lot of space as far as the library. And so I always say, you know, because it, the Bible, you say, well, you know, they prayed and then yada, yada. But when he records the whole thing, I go like, whoa, there's something, there's something here that I personally ought to know and look at. Now, his conditions behind his prayer were pretty, I mean, he was a captive to, to Babylon. And has been over 60 years, as we see, as we get into this passage, we'll see that when this prayer comes along and he talks about the 70 weeks in prophecy, he's already been in captivity as a young, as a young person, somewhere probably between 10 and 17. Um, he went through three years of training under Babylon in their university setting. Uh, and uh, they usually got through there by 14, and they went through three years of that. And so we're not quite sure what his age, we, we don't have it. But when he does this prayer and he talks about the 70 weeks, he's been there 69 years. And his life is kind of like Joseph. I mean, God just promotes this guy. I mean, he, 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 he carries Christ so well that unbelievers go like, whoa, this guy has a relationship with God that I need. And, uh, and, he, and his life reflects almost, it almost mirrors Joseph's success in, in Egypt. And to be successful in Babylon as a captive, it, they, they were tough. Babylonians, I mean, if you see what they did in the fifth cycle of discipline to Judah, they were, 
<laughs> they were tough people. Well, anyhow, so I want to look. We, we are now, uh, Daniel identifies that we're in verse 1, that, that we're in the first year of uh, Darius. Uh, he's the son of Hazarus, of uh, a Median descent. And so what we're introduced to in, in chapter 9 is the medio persian captivity. I mean, they have now come in and took Babylon. And so we're in that period. We're going to see that we're going to, and that was, um, when it was done, it was 539. <clears throat> you know, the interesting thing about Daniel, that he served four different kings. And he served two kings of Babylon, and he served two kings of Medo-Persians. I mean, that's something. Um, <clears throat> and so he, he's discussing this now. Uh, this is the prepar This is the circumstances behind Daniel's prayer, uh, and uh, Darius has been made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, or, or the Babylonians. Uh, in the first year of his reign, in the first year of his reign, I Daniel observed. Now watch this. In the books, the numbers of the year which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet. You know, I, Jeremiah, you know, you got Daniel. Here, here's Daniel. On this side, over here in the homeland is Jeremiah right now. Over here, the prophet Jeremiah, he, he is in the homeland. And here's Daniel in Babylon. And he comes in in 605 in what's called the first deportation under Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel's there. Uh, Jeremiah's over here. And in the second deportation in 597, uh, Ezekiel comes in. And Jeremiah, what he's talking about here is Jeremiah is writing doctrinal lessons and sending them into this group. And they're pounding it out. He's sending them, and, and you can read about this. There, there'll be passages in our text, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that's where that's found. But um, there, and so, when, what, what we're talking about in verses 9, 1, 2, and 3, he's praying his prayer is based on the word of God, like all prayers should be if they, if they want to answer right, the word of God, uh, like 1 John 5, 14, 15, right? You know, if I ask anything according to his will, he hears me and then I get my answer. So this right here is a very, he, his prayer is going up and the word of God that's directing his prayer life for his circumstances in his life is coming from Jeremiah who's sending Bible lessons into him. He tells you that. Now look at this. Look at this. He says, verse 2, In the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books, in, in the scrolls, that, that would be letters, in the scrolls, the, they're called books, but actually it's the word scrolls, um, or the letters being mailed to us, the number of years which were revealed as the word of God to Jeremiah the prophet, and this is what he re re revealed. He revealed for the completion of the desolation of Israel, namely 70 years. See, that 70 years is going to come out to the 70 weeks. That whole concept is going to come out of that prayer into a prophecy. He's going to, listen, before he ever closes his prayer, Gabriel's going to show up and he's going to go right into prophecy. <clears throat> um, and so... He was interested, listen, he's been in captivity for, for 69 years, and Jeremiah sends him in some information doctrinally that tells him that 70 years and Israel will go back, and he's given all this, and he's given that, and out of this prayer, out of, Jerem out of the word of God sent by Jeremiah, listen, 
listen, God always gives, always gives you from Bible study what's prevalent to your life and needed. Now, whether you accept it or not, who knows? I spend, listen, I spend as much time in prayer as I do in Bible study. Once I learned that God sends people who need what I got, I don't know what they need. I don't even know who they are most of the time. So I can spend time with the one who does know who moves them in, right? Who comes. And that's how I feel. I mean, I don't know. I just, I just cook the meal he gives me. And so, and, well, anyhow. So Daniel, Daniel, Jeremiah is feeding Daniel. He's feeding all of them in captivity. It's, it's going to the exiles. It, it, the, the ones in exile, it's going to the top leaders who are passing it down, right? Uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, and, and prophets that are there, the key leaders, and they're feeding the pe people. And out of that, out of that word of God, he's come to realize what Jeremiah has been teaching them about how this thing's going to end. He's taught them how it started, and he's taught them how it's going to end. And he's paying attention to how this thing's going to end. I've been there 69 years, you're going to see. How's this thing going to end? And he tells them. And, and boy, is he interested in that. And what he's going to get in the out of that is going to come prophecy that's for the future. It, it, it deals with the second coming of Christ. Well, the prophecy is all about the second coming of Christ. Of course, it's a huge prophecy of the 70 weeks. It's going to can't scan a, a large section of time, but it, it's going to go all the way to the future. Um, and all of its future of where he is right now. And so he says, listen to this. This, this is the word of God that's been sent by Jeremiah in there. He's so thankful to have it. Do you understand that in captivity? Amen. This is new stuff. I mean, he's been running on the old stuff, right? Recycling what he had every time he gets something new. Boy, what, how, how interesting that is. And he always knows it is something from the Lord for my life that I need now. I hope we get that. And so here he says, so I gave my attention to the Lord God. Isn't that interesting? You know why? Because he's the one that's running the whole show. I mean, the Lord is directing Jeremiah to give it to Daniel and Ezekiel, and they're passing it on, and he just sees how wonderful God is in the midst of all of his circumstances. Right? That's what makes all things work together for good. In the circumstances themselves, that's not what makes them work for good. It is God is good is what makes them work for good. Right? So I gave my attention to the Lord God. Now, let me tell you, that's Yahweh Elohim. That's Yahweh Elohim. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says the Lord my God. My Lord God is actually how it says. You know why it says that? Okay, let me tell you something about these two words. Yahweh, you learn this in Genesis. In Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis, you learn that God is Elohim. That is, when you look at who God is in his essence, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you know, and we put all the essence of God in that box. He's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's immutable, he's veracity, he's sovereign, he's eternal life. You know all that. That's Elohim. When you're talking about the Lord which is Yahweh, you're talking about a personal relationship where he is compassionate and patient and merciful. You understand? Ah. When God becomes your father, when he becomes your father, once you grow a tad bit in your spiritual life, God will become your daddy. You don't ever think of God as a sovereign creator God. But who thinks that way anymore? We do know that's who he is. That's my dad. That's my daddy. I mean, he's one thing at, on the job, but he's another thing at the house. Right? I mean, and the word Lord, that's found in Genesis 2, when you have the man and woman created in the garden with God. And it, they're in the garden with the Lord God. 
my Lord God. And you have this personal relationship, this personal relationship. So when you see this word Lord, you're talking about, you're talking about the second member of the God who had, where relationship with God comes. No man can come to the Father except through me, Christ, right? John 14, 6. I mean, that's the story. It's the story of the whole Bible. But when you see this word, when you see God, you're talking about the sovereign God. You're talking about the essence of God and how powerful that is. But when you're talking about the Lord, you're talking about the intimate personal relationship that you have with somebody who's compassionate and patient and kind. Are you, do you understand that? See, there's a difference. And there's a difference in those words, and you see it in Genesis 1 and 2. You see it clear as a bell. <clears throat> clear as a bell. Uh, so I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes, because that's the circumstances of his life under the old covenant. He's between a rock and a hard place, <laughs> as we used to say. I gave my attention to the Lord, to my Lord God, to seek him. And this word seek means, it's the word face. It means to be face to face or in the presence of personal. That's what face, face is. To be, this word seek is the word face. To be face to face with him. To seek him, uh, to seek him, to seek into, to seek his presence. Um, uh, here, here it would be, uh, to seek an audience with. There's the idea. To seek an audience with. That's the word. And, uh, and he's confident he can get it. Aren't we all? We, we all know Hebrews, the fourth chapter, 14 through 16. Hmm? And confident, confident I can get this audience with him. I mean, a lot of people may not be able to get in the office, but when once somebody from home walks in, they, they go right to the head of the line, don't they? Yeah. So... What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this this morning after uh, this evening after a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are a priest in the church age. First Peter 2 tells you that. It becomes your responsibility to bring your life into a proper protocol conduct for Bible study can't study the Bible in carnality. You have to study it spiritual as a spiritual book for spiritual people with spiritual information. You can't study carnal. How would I identify if I'm carnal or not? First Corinthians third chapter talks about it. Well, personal sin would be evidence. The Holy Spirit has been grieved and quenched. How do I resolve it? I confess my sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if I confess my sin, if I name it, if I cite it, if I bring my life into agreement that I violated the relationship, my relationship with the Lord with personal sin, it could be mental attitude sin, sins the tongue avert sin, then I confess it. it. Through my priesthood, I confess it. And I am cleansed. I am forgiven and cleansed. And it restores me to sanctification. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit as I study the word of God that I might get divine revelation uh, personal to my life. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way both by automobile and by internet. We pray the same protocol that we use in our Bible study would be true for those who are listening with us, that they would enter into classroom etiquette, uh, place themselves in a place where they're not going to be distracted for this hour of study, that they be filled with the Holy Spirit, that he might teach them as the third member of the Godhead dwells in the believer's life, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.
All right, so what I've done is I've divided the prayer into two sections. I'm going to do the first part tonight, dealing with the circumstances, and tomorrow night I'm going to deal with the content of that prayer. It's a pretty powerful one because God recorded the whole thing for us. So there's, there's got to be much in it to be, to be learned from about our prayer life. So we'll talk about that tomorrow night. But tonight we're going to talk about uh, this aspect. And then, of course, the second half of, of Daniel 9, we'll talk about the 70 weeks. Um, Daniel is probably best known when, when, when people say, you know anything about Daniel? He's probably best known for his prophecies, not his prayers. I mean, the prophecies of Daniel are just, they fill up the pages of the scriptures. And listen, he had an, an enormous prophetic ministry with every king he served under. He had a great prophetic ministry, both Babylon and uh, the, the Medio Persians. He had both, both of them were during that period of time. But for me, whenever I see God record a whole prayer from start to finish, I go like, that's got to be pretty important to God to put that whole thing down there because most of the time it just said, you know, he prayed and, uh, you know, feeding the 5,000, what did the Lord do? Well, he, he, he prayed and then he fed him. We have no idea what that prayer was, but we, you know, we understand he prayed and fed, uh, tapped into the supreme, didn't he? The Lord, so... But this one, when you have them, it, it, it serves you well to read them, to study them for your own personal life. And my, it, that, at least that's my opinion. Um, and so we're going to do that because uh, I, I want it. And since I teach, that's <laughs> I need it. So just understand if you come tomorrow night, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to teach you something that I needed to learn and uh, whether you're benefited by that. So circumstances... What, what this prayer deals with is the circumstances behind a prayer, and I, I, want, you to I want to show you how, how sometimes our circumstance, and he, and he deals with a lot of the first three verses. He talks about the, his situation in life, and that's pretty good. Then when he gets into the content of his prayer, he just moves into how we're going to resolve it. And so this is, again, one of those unique places where we actually see a guy whose life is a, got a whole lot of stuff going in it, uh, that are pretty extreme uh, in captivity and what's all going on. Uh, I want to share with you tonight about the circumstances of three things, verse 1, 2, and 3 that I saw, uh, and to remind us all that there are circumstances behind our life that, that drive us to prayer uh, and for resolution, and that's the importance of prayer. I mean, God knows all this stuff that's going on. And he wants to know where you are, where you are in your spiritual life on the resolution of it. So we all go in with circumstances and lay it all out there, and sometimes it makes sense, and sometimes it don't. We just throw it all out there. We just throw up, and uh, he goes like, well, there it is. And then out of that comes some kind of a resolution on how we can resolve it, right? I mean, what does the word of God say about it? And how will God work with me on the resolution of it? And that's what we see in this prayer of Daniel. So I, number one, I got three points. Uh, point number one, Daniel 1 gives us the first circumstance behind the prayer. And that is there's been a change. There's been a change in uh, kings and government. A whole governmental system. Uh, uh, now we have the the metal Persian uh, group in, they're in power now. They're in power. They're about to become that power structure. They have, they have co come in and conquered Babylon uh, or in the process of it. In the first year of Darius, he says. So what we have... If you now he, he talks a great deal about Jeremiah in his book because Jeremiah is feeding him. He, he Jeremiah is his pastor teacher. That's his senior pastor, and he's feeding him. He's just feeding him, feeding him, feeding him. He can't wait. I mean, he has an, as somebody carries these in to him. The mailman sent from Jeremiah into him. Jeremiah's over here in the homeland with 
with hardships. Babylon didn't leave him in good shape. <laughs> and he's over here. Actually, these people over here are better off than these people here as far as, you know. But what they lack is the word of God. They, they, you know, they didn't get a chance to say, oh, wait, before you drag me off, can I get my Bibles and my notebooks? Uh, <laughs> that didn't work. So th this is a life, a lifeline to the guys in captivity. Jeremiah is a lifeline, and he understands it. And this great pastor teacher just sent him, sent him. He's just, you know, whatever he's teaching over here, he juices it up and sends it over there. And... Um, and that's, and that's what's going on right here when he talks about this. But it's well worth your time to go back and look at, for example, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 50, 17 through 20, when he mentions Israel, Babylon, and Assyria. And, and the reason he does is because Israel, the north kingdom, went under Assyria's rulership in 722. And the south kingdom, and then Babylon conquers them. And then Babylon gets the southern kingdom under, for the same reason, fifth cycle of divine discipline recorded in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. The priest nation of Israel, God would put them through five cycles of discipline before the fifth cycle took them out. They're well worth your reading. Most people don't know about that. And that's well worth your reading. Okay. So in, in this, Jeremiah does a little quick history. He says, well, here's Israel, the priest nation of God, a nation among nations, a light to the Gentiles, right? Isaiah, Isaiah talks about that in 46 and 49. A light to the Gentiles. Well, they were kind of like jo jo Jonah with a light, right? I mean, he was always sticking that, turning it off, sticking it in his pocket. So... Uh, but that's who they were to be and, and weren't willing to do that. So he talks about it, gives a synopsis of it. He talks about Israel who went under a power called Assyria. Assyria went under another power called Babylon. So the North Kingdom, when he says, talks about it, the North Kingdom in 722 went under the fifth cycle, the fifth cycle, not, the, not one, two, three, four, the fifth cycle went under it in 722 and the Southern Kingdom that he's under, 586 B.C., to Babylon. Now another nation has come along and took Babylon. And it won't be long. And if you pay any attention to Daniel's prophecy, he's going to tell you, and another nation is going to come along and get them. And another nation is going to come along and get them. And Israel is in for a long haul of Gentile power over their life. Listen to me until Jesus comes the second time. That's the curse of Coniah talked about in Jeremiah, the 22nd chapter. Jeremiah is a powerful book. <clears throat> Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persian uh, people. They call the fall of Babylon, they record it as 539. Okay, Daniel was taken captive in the first deportation of Babylon in 605 B.C. He's going to go on and talk in Daniel 10.1. In Daniel 10.1, I'm in chapter 9, but in chapter 10, verse 1, he's going to say that in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, Daniel, Daniel, now here's what you know. Daniel went in at 605 he is still operating in 539 under another ruler. That puts him in there 69 years so far. Do you understand that? Listen, and a lot of historians, they get, they get excited when they're 69 years. But listen, the fifth cycle is what's important, and that doesn't occur till 586. So your 70 years, do you understand, is not working from the first deportation nor the second deportation. It's operating from the third. And so the big number is 516. 516 is a pretty powerful number because they're going to, by that time, they're going to be back in the land. 
under Cyrus. They're going to be back in the land. The people are going to be back in the land and have restored, are in the process and nearly completed of the restore of the temple. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal because God took that temple out in this 586. In 586, they leveled the temple. So that's, it's just kind of interesting. Um, so you're dealing with a lot of war and conflict and captivity. A lot of people, I mean, just think of all these cap, cap, captive people that went to Babylon, young, healthy. Listen, they lost everything. They lost family. And listen, if their family was too old to travel, they left them. They just left them. Even that was pretty good because a lot of nations don't leave you. They, they march you along and then bury you on your way. So the fifth cycle of divine discipline of Judah to Babylon occurred in 586 B.C. and it lasted 70 years. One of the great passages on the actual fifth cycle occurring is 2 Kings 25 if you want to read about it. Not now, but later you can read about it because you can read in detail all about what happened with the king of Judah, 2 Kings 25. The passage that I would be interested in your reading is 2 Chronicles 36, 15 through 21, not now. I've just recorded 20 and 21 on your paper. And notice I emphasize the word until. Until. Okay, which is kind of an interesting word in itself. And the interesting thing about until, it still means that way today. I mean, no matter how many languages it goes, word, goes through, the word until still means the same thing. If I say, I won't see you, you know, until, you know, tomorrow, or I, you know, you know what I mean? You still know that, don't you? I mean, the word, it's kind of an interesting word. It doesn't, just kind of an interesting word. So watch the three. These are the three. Uh, that, and that he that uh, the second crown was talking about until the rule of, of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Say this is prophetic. Until the land enjoys a Sabbath. You know why the fifth cycle, why the fifth cycle came to Judah, and why at seventy years, and why Daniel is going to have seventy times seven. It's Sabbath. I mean, I know we're New Testament, but sometimes you got to read the Old Testament too. This whole deal here, and I wrote it down on your paper, a reference. Um, well, it'll be on your next page apparently. But this is this is going to this is out of Leviticus. There's a whole Sabbath system. You know, most people they talk about the Sabbath. They're only talking about one day out of a week. But there was an enormous, elaborate system of Sabbaths in the Old Testament. We don't pay attention to any of it today. And, and for good reason. And for good reason. But the Sabbath system, now the Mosaic Law turned it into a whole system. But the, the Sabbath system came out of Genesis. It didn't come out of the Mosaic Law. It was before the Mosaic Law. In fact, it came from the seventh day of creation. It's called the Sabbath rest, right? And do you know why, why you have that? No, it's for Jesus Christ. It's for Jesus Christ. It, no, it's talking about the actual person of Jesus Christ who would come into the world and where, the, where that rest would finally rest would be in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. How do I, how do I know that? Well, let's just hold a minute. Let's go to Mark. This is how I know this. I know this from Mark. Mark, the second chapter, in verse 27. Now, uh, temple worship in the sense that it flows through Jesus Christ and yada yada but you understand that part is You're going deeper. yeah I am 
Well, I'm like, no, I'm just showing you where. No, I'm yeah. Glad. Yeah. I have to ask because yeah. Well, that's all right. Yeah, this is Tuesday night. Ask the pastor. This is like whole <laughs> this is all right. Now look at Mark because Jesus is going to tell us in Mark two twenty seven and twenty eight, and, and he's talking about the Sabbath. He says the Sabbath, and and he's talking about if you have a reference Bible, he's talking about Genesis, the seventh day of creation. He said the Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath, right? The man comes on the sixth day, Sabbath comes on the seventh. So the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. See, that takes us back to Genesis. Then he says, but let me tell you what was important about it. Verse 28, consequently, in other words, based on that whole biblical principle, consequently, you understand consequently, I mean, without without understanding verse 27, consequently doesn't have any meaning to my life. But once I understand what it's attached to, I go like, whoa, 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 whoa. So consequently, the Son of Man is Lord, Lord even of the Sabbath. So he would come and heal and everybody would go like, you can't do that on the Sabbath. And listen, he didn't do it to irritate him. I mean, every, every time he did something really big, he did it on the Sabbath. And everybody went nuts. Right? He didn't do it to cause them. Well, I, let, me sh let me show you, boys, how you really rile up a group. He broke the rules. Right? He did this. Right? He did this to show them, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I have the power to heal the unhealable or unthinkable healer. Healing. He did the unthinkable. Somebody born blind. All of his life he lived. Now he's a, he's a senior adult and he goes like, boom. He's got eyeballs and everything. I mean, how does that work? If you're blind, it worked pretty good. But on my best day, I couldn't do that. Best I could do is get a pair of glasses. If they couldn't see, then I'd just put dark ones on. But, I mean, how do you do that? So, listen. The reason, there are three reasons, there are three reasons given why the fifth came to Judah, right? Until, until, until. The, the rule of the Persians is going to come and to fulfill the word spoken by Jeremiah until the land enjoys, enjoys its Sabbath because there was a Sabbath system. Every seventh year, the land Every, fir every seventh day of the week, every seventh year, and every, every seventh, seventh, 49, we had on the 50, we had Jubilee. And all the land uh, went back to the original owner. The original owner and the Word of God. I mean, you had to have the Bible to know where the deed was. Didn't own a Bible, then you you couldn't prove your you couldn't prove your family ownership. <laughs> well, until the land enjoys its Sabbath, all the days of its desolation. You know what we're talking about? Desolation. We're talking about the land. We're talking about the promised land. Until until all the days of its the land's desolation, it kept Sabbath. Until 70 years were completed. You're going you're gonna to stay there until, and God set that rule up. 70, and it was all about the land. So they weren't observing the Sabbath, and the Lord said, You hadn't observed it, so the land's going to get its Sabbath? Yeah, the only Sabbath they observed was the weekly one. They never observed that one. They never observed that one. And that didn't set them up for you not to observe. They did the weekly, never did anything else. And now they're yep. And when you count your numbers, this right here, that's 490. And right there, when you count that back, when you put that back, you're going to find you're in the beginning of a monarchy. I know numbers sometimes drive you nuts, don't they?
Well, I'm a farmer, and you had to rest your land, but we didn't rest it. We rested it by putting a different crop with it. Yeah. Like, we would rotate. We would put alfalfa. If we, if we worked that land on crash co cash crops a certain number of years, then we put it in alfalfa. Then we put the cattle after we did the hay. Then we put the cattle out there uh, for them to fertilize it. Then we plowed it all under and started it again. Yep, yep, yep. I, yeah, I don't know if we had a system. I mean, but we had a system of rest, resting the land, replenishing it. Well, I guess. I don't know. I know I've always gotten tired on top of the dirt, so I don't know then about the dirt. It, it, dirt's never talked to me, so I don't know. Um, I know. Look at the outline of history that's important to us, and, and I gave you some passages like Daniel 2, 7, and 8, well worth your reading. But I'm going to show you something. When uh, the, numbers, the Old Testament numbers shift all the time because new archaeology, they're finding new things, things that they were. Uh, so when I was in school uh, many years ago, the dividing of the monarchy was 941. If you have a good study Bible, like a Ryrie NAS study Bible, they're going to tell you that year now has been determined to be 931. Well, I wrote this all out and before I, I went back and checked it. I thought, you know, I would have. Now, some of the numbers haven't changed, 586, 722, some of those, but some of the other, because it's based on other people's history on when they came in and how we can document it. And, um, but, so I put down my old number, 941, but if you have a good study Bible, they're going to tell you 931. And so I don't know. I, but I thought I ought to tell you that. Uh, then you, you go from the divided kingdom to the fall of Syria, then the united kingdom to the fall of Judah, and then, then you have the system all the way to Rome, in 70 AD. <clears throat> Most of those numbers are going to be pretty fair other than the first one, I guess, the divided kingdom. Uh, point number two, at least f most scholars think that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that good of a historian to go back and, I mean, this has been about the most I could do with it. In Daniel 9-2, with the second thing, of circ the second circumstance behind Daniel's prayer, he mentions that in, the, in this first year, um, I, Daniel, I, Daniel, in the first year, I, Daniel, observed the books of the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophets, and it was the completion of the, of the desolation of, of Israel, or of, Ju of Jerusalem. Um, the land, the, here, here were the things that were important. The land and the city, and it was a whole, and this is interesting how Jeremiah is going to say this. He's going to say, it, it was the, it's the holy land, it's the holy city, and the holy people, because they bear, the, all three of these bear the holy name of God. It's a holy land, it's a holy city, a holy people, because they bear the name of God. Now, prophets that understood that, like Jeremiah, Isaiah, all these great prophets that, that understood this principle, even Abraham, uh, people like that, they would, they would put that before, when God said, look, I'm going to put the hammer down on so-and-so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done messing, I'm going to do it. They would all go to intercessory prayer, right? And they would bring this back to him. Yes, but you're, and, and it's about covenant. It's about, they would always bring up, all, all, God always has a covenant with people. Always has a covenant. And, he would, and they would always bring his covenant. And they, they, would, I, they would say to him, yes, but listen, we, we, listen th th we as a people of God, we bear your name, we bear your book, we do this, we do that. Um, how is this going to affect the ministry out there? How is it going to affect people that we said we... We are followers of Christ and God. I mean, how are we going to do that? And they would bring up the covenant, and they would argue the covenant position to him. And then 
you know, then God would do what he's going to do. But they always argued it. And that's what, and that's what he's doing in this. They, and listen, you'd be smart to understand. You know, you're a covenant. Why don't people take, listen, you think marriage is a covenant? Yes. <laughs> listen, we're in a lot of covenants. We're under the new covenant. Do you know how important it would be for you to know what is contained in the new covenant when you have a prayer before God about your circumstances of life? Do you think that would be important? Most people don't even know what I'm talking about. Do you, how about a covenant in marriage? Wouldn't this be good if your marriage is in some problem? Wouldn't that be good to state that before God and, and identify that? I would think so. We're in a, listen, we're in a lot of covenants with God under the new covenant. He expects a lot more out of us because he put the third member of the Godhead inside our body. Agreed? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. See, your body's not even your own. You know, I say that to people. They want to push back and like, that's my idea. Where do you ever get that idea that, uh, you know, and I go, like, they're going to pick up a stone and hit me or something. And I go, like, look, I didn't come up with that idea. I mean, you're going to have to throw that rock all the way to the he third heaven. The God, right. Isn't that true? Exactly. That's very good. The rainbow. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, if I lived on the coast, I'd be claiming that all the time, wouldn't you? Huh? Every time a big storm came in, I'd be going like, I got a little boat. I don't have a big one, Father. You told me there, a little boat would work. <clears throat> but anyhow, here's what I like about Daniel. Here's what I want you to pick up from Daniel. He's no different than you and I. I mean, we get to think of these guys, you know, they're stained glass guys. We think that, oh, boy. But look, as, the, as we might say, the, the, he put his pants on the same way we do. He, he, but he did learn some things that we would be wise to learn. Here's one of them. Daniel, we know from the first three verses, and I put it on your paper, Daniel had a consistent daily study of the scriptures. Inhale, exhale. You think you're going to get to where Daniel what you need to be unless you get serious with the word of God? Listen, he couldn't, listen, when I was in the army, you couldn't wait for mail call. Mail call, boy. Mail call. <sighs> and you had to throw nothing away. You had to throw nothing away. Because you might not get one in next week. You read last week's, buddy. So when I'm, when I'm sitting there with Daniel over here, and I, I'm sitting him, and he's waiting, on the, he's waiting on the mail, I understood some of that anxiety, some of that, oh, boy. And then when a letter comes in, you go, like, wow. And everybody did it. Everybody went off their little corner and sat down and read it and read it and read it. And how bad you felt for guys who never went to mail call and never got one. That was terrible. That is terrible. Well, anyhow, Daniel's consistent daily study of the scriptures, both the inhale and the exhale, like, like uh, here are two good scriptures for me at least, 2 Timothy 2.15, study, study to, show thy, to show thyself, study to show yourself, study to show yourself. If you don't get past that, that'd be enough. Right? Study to show yourself a work button, Right? Need not to be ashamed of the word, rightly dividing, right? If you got a good pastor, he helps you with that. He helps you do that. And then uh, that same book, 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter 16, 17, all scripture is God breathed. That's the principle of inhale and exhale of the word of God. And, and, it, it, and it develops spiritual growth maturity so that you can do the work of God in this life. How good is that stuff? Eh? Jeremiah said doctrinal lessons to those in the Babylonian captivity called the exiles. In Jeremiah 21, uh, 29, 1. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exiles, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Is not God faithful? God. And listen, 
Somehow or another, God set it up where that mail could get to him. You know, we always doing that with people overseas uh, that are in countries where they're antagonistic to the Word of God. So we, we try to create all different kinds of ways to get the mail in, right? Try to get Bibles in. Try to get doctrinal messages uh, lessons into these people. Now, the internet has really helped us a lot. Um, that has really helped us un until they get a hold of how to censor all this. Most of them, third world countries, you don't have to worry about it. But uh, other nations that have gotten very smart in this, uh, they understand how to block stuff and all that. But we all go through that struggle. But listen, they're over here, God is mot motivating him to do this. And they're highly motivated for him to do this because they need it. It is, it is their lifeline. It is their lifeline. And it's just wonderful that, I mean, here is God. And he's, and he's working this whole system. I mean, that's, that's what's so neat about it. You know, Jeremiah, he's writing them up saying, how am I going to get it over there to him? And he, he, he's got these done, and he prays, and what's the father do? He shows him a, a, a person that has contact in the land, and he sends it in there, and it shows up at the office of Daniel, who is an official there. I mean, how good does this stuff work? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't, Hollywood, but other than Hollywood, you couldn't do this. You can do this in Hollywood. Hollywood and God, is this good stuff? Jeremiah 29th chapter 10, 11, thus saith the Lord. When 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill your good my good word to you to bring you back to this place. And, I, and this, this is quoted all the time by people, a lot of times out of context, but it's okay if they got the point. For I know the plans that I have for you saith the Lord. Plans for good welfare and for, that should be and, not add, and not for calamity. That's kind of an easy word for what they went through, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, guy just, uh, that's kind of a, Plans for welfare, not for calamity. Watch this. To give you a future and a hope. And do you think those letters coming from him over to him? And listen, and Jeremiah knowing that these people are coming back because God told them. How good is that? I mean, he's saying, everybody, clean up your yards. Get everything cleaned up. Listen, let's get a big sign made up. They're coming back. They're coming back. They're coming back. We kept up with it. We got 70 years. We're, we're, we're getting close. Come on now. Let's get this big sign made. Welcome home. Come on now. I mean, who else has this kind of... I mean, this is the Word of God. Why would we not study the Word of God when it has so much of this information like this? Huh? You think God isn't... But God wants to do this with our life. I mean, he's, he's moved all the furniture around to make our life this way. I mean, he's the big furniture guy. He moves all the stuff around for us. Jeez. Well, Jer Jeremiah told them that the land would be desolate for 70 years because of Sabbath violations. Uh, Jeremiah 25, 11. Here's where you can find that Sabbath system to the land. That's in Leviticus 25, 1 through 7. And, and well worth your time, once again, I remind you this verse, 2 uh, Chronicles 36, verses 14 through 21, give you the three reasons for the 70 years of the fifth, under, under the fifth cycle. Idolatry, rejection of the directive will of God, and Sabbath violation. <clears throat> and you really want to pay attention. God, God raised up Cyrus and... Boy, I mean, Cyrus just went, go, go home. Go home. 
Go home. Go home. Go home and build your cities. Go home. I mean, where does that come from? Conquering. Power. Persians. I mean, God is faithful, isn't he? God said 70 years, and don't you worry about how it's going to happen. Well, how is it going to happen? Babylon, how's it going to happen? Don't worry about it. I got it. I said 70, 70's there. I got it. And boy, he raised up a guy. This is like the Jews. How does that work? It's like them. Here's the third thing, and close. Daniel 9.3 gives us the third circumstance behind his prayers. It says, so I gave my attention to the Lord God. You know how he's going to do that? Prayer. Prayer. Okay? Prayer. I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplications. Daniel teaches us a second important thing, consistency in what people call quiet time. Study of the scripture, and I don't mean just reading the Bible, I mean studying it. Now people go like, well, I read through the Bible a whole year. What did you learn? <laughs> Nothing. Well, I don't call that, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in you somehow you know, we're going to give you a Schwinn bicycle or something. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what, read it to learn something from it. Now you got it. You may, may, may be on one verse for a long time because God just won't turn you loose from it. You go like, he go, okay, I think I got it. And you go like, well, sleep on it and I'll talk to you tomorrow. You get up in the morning and go like, see, I told you, you're not happy. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel's consistent quiet time in the presence of the Lord with prayer regarding personal circumstances of life. Paul, Paul says, be anxious for nothing. He says, you got to replace it. Well, it's not. You got to replace it. You got to replace it. Here's how you replace it. In everything by prayer and supplication. No, here's what we want to do. We're going to call up our friends and chat until we're sick about what we're going through. That's not what he said to do. If you're anxious, don't call up all your friends and chit-chat and argue and fuss and uh, don't do that. Right? Go to the, that's very good. Go to the throne and not the phone. If you don't mind, I might take that from, I just stole that. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. That's what he's doing, isn't it? Prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, wouldn't that be important? Wouldn't that be important to tell him what you are thankful for and how a reminder to you how faithful he is to you? With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and watch. Here's how you know if you got it. I went from be anxious for nothing, right? I was anxious about everything. I'm not anxious. I'm anxious about nothing because in everything, nothing, I've replaced anxious about nothing with everything, with God, and what's he done? What, how has he replaced my anxiety? Peace. peace of God. Watch this now how he describes it. And the peace of God, which, and listen, listen, is this a promise to you? Yes. Well, buddy, take that thing. If you're walking away from that prayer time, you still got anxiety. You go back to your prayer time. Right? Because you haven't, you haven't got into the nothing and everything part of it. Well, I don't know how it's going to happen. How is it going to go? I don't know. I don't know. Are you talking about tomorrow? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Do you know you're anxious? Yeah. <laughs> well, then get rid of it. How do I do it? In everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God. Right? God's in charge. God's in, God's in charge, whether you're over here or over here. God's in charge. You pray according to his will. 
You know He hears us. You know if He hears us, you get your request. Therefore, be anxious about nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication, lay your request, the will of God, before the will of the Father. And let the peace of God, watch this now, and let the peace of God, which surpasses, surpasses. You know, that's somebody who passes you on the highway and makes you look like you're standing still. That's surpassing. You're like, he's going to get a ticket. You, and down the road, you'll find him, right? He just passed me, doing. I was doing 70, and he just went by me like I was standing still. And down the road, he is. If he's lucky, huh? If he's lucky. I got you, Glenn. I got you, Glenn. I'm not going to, Glenn, if he, pu if he pulls me over, it's for coffee. It's if he pulls me over, it's for coffee. And the peace of God, listen, that's the, that's the antidote, the anxiety, isn't it? Yes. What he said around, when it, uh, listen, he tells you what to do. And let the, peace, uh, let the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. See, anxiety is trying to figure it all out and put it in a neat little package. Forget it. We'll guard Listen, the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Will guard it. Guard it from what? Anxiety. Listen, God, God, is, God is faithful. God is faithful. And then I did an acrostic of prayer uh, out of the need for you to know how to pray. <laughs> I don't have time to go to it tonight. But the acrostics is simple enough. I gave you a Bible verse. Be well with your, well with your time. I love that acrostic. It, it is my acrostic. I love it because it tells me it's five points on prayer that make prayer successful and powerful in your life. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll dismiss the internet and then we'll have our personal time of prayer here. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for the prayer of Daniel is he identifies all the circumstances of the life behind it and how God is the one in his life that resolves everything. He don't sit around and be anxious and wring his hands. He takes it, takes it to the man, takes it to the Lord. And, and there he leaves it. And what he walks away with, the confidence of the word of God that he's prayed according to the will of the Father, it is now up to the will of the Father to carry it through. And there, there, therefore, when he resumes his life, he has peace and not anxiety. He has the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension. It's so, so far beyond what we could have imagined. And it guards our heart and our mind. We're so thankful for that principle tonight out of the life of Daniel. And we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.